He's a senior lecturer in politics and, <coughs> and contemporary history at the University of Chichester. And a, uh, uh, he gained his PhD from the University of, uh, of Nottingham and Neuchâtel and currently works uh, on Britain's and France post-colonial post post security uh, rules in West Africa. So uh, I, I, I can guess that you are an expert in what you will say. So you know what, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Danny, for this very generous introduction. And thank you very much uh, to the Israeli Commission and the International Commission for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. So I'll speak here today about how uh, these two gentlemen, to a certain extent, the one on the left doesn't need any introduction, it's General Charles de Gaulle, and to the right we have Félix Oufouébouani, the longtime president of Côte d'Ivoire, how these two countries uh, colluded and established a neo-colonial security relationship already during the early independence period. Now, as you know, in 1958, de Gaulle returned to power and he tried to save the empire of France through the community, which would give a degree of independence to Francophone African countries without, however, giving them the responsibility for external defense or economic uh, or foreign policy or economic foreign relations. But this community rapidly disintegrated. Already in 58, uh, Sekuture of Guinea uh, rejected the constitution. And also in 59, late 59, when the Mali Federation asked for independence and it was granted by France, it rapidly disintegrated. This did not mean, however, that France did not, not, did not want to cling on to its empire in Francophone Africa. So it established cooperation agreements which also covered military assistance and defence relations with the former colonial powers. And people like Oufouébouani were very happy to establish such relationships because they counted on French protection and support. Félix Oufouébouani was pretty much France's man in Africa because A, Côte d'Ivoire was an economically and strategically important former colony which also had a lot of French nationals living on its soil. Oufouébouani was a staunch anti-communist and he was even portrayed by the Soviet Union as a troubadour of colonialism. And also he was very important for a polit from a political perspective for France because he also actually was a leading figure in African groupings, especially the Council of the Entente, which was also composed at the time by Niger, Daomé, which is now Benin, and Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, and also in the moderate uh, Monrovia group of African states. And de Gaulle's Monsieur l'Afrique, Jacques Focard, who probably doesn't need to be introduced properly as famous as he is in Francophone African history, he wanted to protect, together with Oufouébouani, Francophone Africa from not only Eastern, but also Western, namely American intrusion. So it was the précaré, the sphere of influence that the French wanted to protect, and this Pax Gallica they wanted to enforce was supposed to be achieved through diplomatic means, intelligence networks and institutions, and notably the armed forces. And the French armed forces were responsible for the external protection of these African countries, but increasingly also for the domestic security of these countries. Now, Oufouébouani, he had an increasing fear of foreign, especially a Ghanaian-sponsored coup. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, he was a Pan-Africanist and increasingly in the early 60s leaned towards the Soviet Union. Also, Oufouébouani, he rather wanted to focus on economic and social investment rather than spending a lot of money on the country's armed forces. And importantly, he also heavily distrusted, and increasingly so, in 62-63, increasingly distrusted his national armed forces. So eventually he chose to put the security of his country into French hands, also at a domestic level. And this, is particularly, this was particularly transparent in 1963. This was a year of coups in Francophone Africa. In January, it kicked off with the assassination of Silvanus Olympia of Togo. In August, the removal of Abbe Fulbert Yulu in Congo Brazzaville. And then, during this period, exact, almost simultaneously to what happened in Francophone, elsewhere in Francophone Africa, Oufouébouani purged his regime 
there was a lot of repression going on in order to streamline Cote d'Ivoire so that he will feel more secure. But coup after coup and in other countries and purges and purges and repressions followed in Cote d'Ivoire. But despite that, he still felt insecure and wanted more protection from France. But for France, it was quite a balancing act to achieve because on the one hand, they wanted to ensure that their men would stay in power and they wanted to show them that they would be there for them. But on the other hand, so shortly after Algeria, if they would become involved in shooting on African civilians in a mass demonstration, this would not make for a good image for France at the international level, especially in the United Nations, where there were more and more African states in the General Assembly who were able to vote. So what this paper shows particularly well is actually that Inasmuch as the French were responsible for establishing a neo-colonial relationship, inasmuch African leaders such as Oufé Boigny were responsible. Now, at the very beginning of independence, when Côte d'Ivoire started to build up its national armed forces together with the Entente states and with the support of French military assistance, they wanted to visibly reduce the French military presence because they did not necessarily want to appear uh, to their African peers as neo-colonial stooges or colonial stooges of the French. At the same time, the French feared that they might lose their military footprint in Francophone Africa. This would open up the space for the Soviets, the Americans and others. But rapidly the table turned. Tables turned. So in 1961, in September already, Oufwe Boigny made it very clear that he wanted to increase rather than to reduce France's forces in Côte d'Ivoire for his own protection. He was increasingly fearful of what he considered to be a Soviet aligned Ghana that could have hostile intentions vis a vis Côte d'Ivoire. So in early 1962, there was the completion, or let's say, uh, the strategic, post-colonial strategic security relation, uh, the security relationship with Côte d'Ivoire and France was firmly established because not only obtained Oufebani obtained to have a specific zone of command tailored to the Entente states under his leadership, but in addition to that, he also entered into a special convention on the conditions of the French armed forces in maintaining public order on the territory of Côte d'Ivoire. An awfully long title, but that's what conventions have normally, right? So this convention allowed to call him on French support if there was a major domestic security emergency. And this was something that would, in 63, be a bit of a problem potentially for France. Now, in 1963, there were the coups in Togo, Congo Brazzaville and Daomey. And simultaneously, as I already mentioned, to these coups, you had crackdowns happening in Côte d'Ivoire against alleged plots against Oufwe Boigny's regime. And at this time, Oufwe Boigny expected not only French diplomatic support, but obviously also increasingly military support. Now, after the assassination of Silvanus Olympio in January 63, Oufwe Boigny was in a state of shock and immediately concluded Kwame Nkrumah is behind that one. So by invoking a communist coup, he, a plot against him, he launched a period of repression. But what's interesting to note here that even before Silvanus Olympius' assassination, he already had put the state institutions to, you know, to repress in place. So there was notably the state security court, which he had put in place following Mamadou Dia's failed coup attempt in Senegal. And the French, they questioned his narrative of an alleged communist plot, but nevertheless, they stood behind Oufwe Boigny's narrative at an international level, which he also justified to the Americans, for instance. So the French support was forthcoming and the whole repression strengthened actually Oufwe Boigny's position at home and in the region because he looked decisive vis-a-vis -vis his allies from the Entente States. And in addition, he received uh, reassurance by de Gaulle that in the future, if there really was an emergency, he would receive French military support. Now, despite all this repression, he got rid pretty much of everyone he suspected of being, you know, in the government, in the country, you know, the hundreds were thrown into jail, but nevertheless, he continued to fear subversion from Ghana and increasingly also distrusted his own security forces as an older, he was already at the time an older statesman, even though he made it up to the early 1990s, he already then distrusted very much the younger generations who were less willing to be as much aligned with France as he was. 
In early August 63, while he was on his usual summer vacation in Paris, a lot of Francophone African leaders, leaders did that at the time, they all had nice flats in nice houses in Paris, he announced to the French authorities that there would be a wave of coups and assassinations in Africa. Now, in order to meet these potential coups, he was calling on the French authorities, especially and personally on de Gaulle, to help him in meeting this threat, and in this particular case, to help him disarm his own security forces, not just the army, but also the entire gendarmerie. De Gaulle eventually agreed to this request, I mean, sort of half-heartedly and a bit reluctantly, because of the special convention that France had signed with Cote d'Ivoire. Secondly, because he had just recently reassured Ophébouani that he would honor the convention, and also because of the strategic and political importance of Cote d'Ivoire, of which Ophébouani was a leader, and he obviously was of regional significance for France. Now, for the French, there were quite a few concerns at the time, especially because it was contemporaneous to the coup against Abbé Fulbert Yulou in Congo Brazzaville. There, the French did not step in to save the Abbé. They did not. The narrative goes that Jacques Focard, uh, Monsieur L'Afrique, he was apparently fishing and couldn't be reached to call the right guys to step in. But the French forces would probably even then not have stepped in because it would have meant shooting on African civilians. And this could have led to mass casualties and this obviously is not good for French propaganda. Now also they feared that their role in the disarming campaign in Cote d'Ivoire would be negatively perceived not only by the Ivorian population but also by Africans more generally. And in addition to that, they questioned Ufwebwani's conspiracy theory that he was meeting various threats, whether they were Nasserite, whether they were Soviet-inspired, or whether they were at a purely domestic level. So they appealed to Ufwebwani at the military commander of the French on the spot in Abidjan, and also the diplomats appealed to him to rearm his own forces, at least those he considered a degree uh, loyal to his regime. So the French were caught in a dilemma. On the one hand, they wanted to protect an African leader who was really important to, him, to them. And also, they wanted to reassure him that they would protect him. But on the other hand, they really wanted to avoid having to respond militarily to what would turn out, could turn out to be a popular uprising. So, on 22 August, during the meeting of the Council of African and Malagasy Affairs in the Elysee, chaired by de Gaulle, they reached a compromise formula. And this compromise formula in a nutshell was that they would guarantee the personal security of African leaders, but not the security of the regime. This is an important difference because you can easily exfiltrate a president, bring him into safety to a French military base or to France. Or it's a different thing, however, if you have to save the regime, meaning you really have to step in with massive force. Now, on 28 August 63, Oufebouani was confronted with a fait accompli. On the one hand, the French told him that they would stop immediately their involvement in the disarming campaign of the, French, of the Ivorian security forces. And, on the other hand, they told him about, their, they told him about their, their new principles, which were that they would just protect his security and not that of his regime. And, he was pretty angry for one, you know, saying, you know, I'm one of your most important allies. And look at the Americans. They protect their allies in uh, far-flung territories. They ob he obviously was referring to the emerging Mobutu uh, in the Congo and also to uh, Vietnam, where the Americans were getting increasingly heavily involved at the time. Thereafter, Ufebouani pursued a two-pronged strategy to get the French more heavily involved and to protect his regime. On the one hand, he armed a militia of loyal party members and veterans, and on the other hand, he carried on warning the French, telling them, guys, you have to step in, you have to protect me and other African leaders more, because otherwise your allies will be gone, and you in, in Francophone Africa are going to be replaced by the Soviets or the Americans who would react to further Soviet involvement. Now, interestingly, he was unable to bring about a heavier French involvement. I mean, they were quite involved, you know, they were stationed in port Bouet, next to Abidjan, in Bouaké, in Côte d'Ivoire, so they were, you know, still quite a deterring factor against anyone who would try to do something. Now, then happened the coup in Daomé, now Benin, in October 1963. And this obviously brought a coup 
for the first time really to Ufwe Bwani's doorstep. And he really disliked that. And what did he do? Yet another wave of repression, but this time also targeting French citizens, such as high school teachers, professors, who had some affiliation with some communist party grouping or some other left-wing factions. But Ufwe Bwani's strategy did not work. Or tactics in that regard did not work with Focard, who stepped in. And by the way, Focard is the only white chap on this picture. And Focard, he said, now, now you have to stop. You really have to stop your repressive measures. There's been enough. Now we really have to return to stability and France would not like to get further involved. Now because Ufe Boigny, his security, his personal security, relied on the French, he had no other choice than to give in. But it was not so much that the French did not want to protect him, or they did not want to keep him as their major ally in the region. The issue was that they thought that after a year of repression, his regime was perfectly safe. There was no credible opposition that could launch a coup or a successful plot against him. So, in addition to that, they also saw that Ufobwani had a quite strong authority in Cote d'Ivoire. There was a presidential constitution. He had a huge moral authority by being uh, one of the first African leaders to really push legislation through in the French Assembly, leading, for instance, to uh, the end of serfdom of Africans following the Second World War. And also he had a certain degree of tribal authority through uh, having inheritance, uh, inherited the chieftaincy, uh, I think it was from his uncle. Now, so they thought that their man in Africa, he was safe. They did not have to do yet more to protect him. So to conclude, Ufwe Boigny, interestingly, was really the prime example of someone being fearful of a coup against him, fearful for the security of himself, the security of his regime, that he decided, while he distrusted his own security forces, especially the military, that he would put his security, not only that of his country and its external defense, but his personal and regime, secu regime security into the hand of the French. He literally signed it over. The coups in Togo and Congo Brazzaville, and to a lesser extent in Daomé, they were mainly a detonator for more of a proper repressive measures. But the institutions were, had already been put in place. It was only as if Ufumwani had been waiting for a pretext to streamline his regime and strengthen his position in Cote d'Ivoire. Now, the French, they were happy to be complicit. They obviously wanted to establish a neo-colonial security relationship beyond the neo-colonial economic relationship they already had with their colonies. So they wanted to have such a relationship, but they did not want to be too heavily perceived doing that, right? So they did want to be caught out by the international community of what they were doing. So therefore, they were, did not want, after having finally managed to get out of Algeria, being caught shooting on African civilians just after they had supposedly, at least on paper, relinquished their empire in Africa. So while Oufouboigny actively colluded with France, the French, they were very happy to collude with him, but in a sort of moderate, more hidden way. And what's really interesting, what that shows is the key involvement of African leaders in establishing neo-colonial security relationships. And this is why, to a certain extent, because there was a pull and push factors, that France still has such an important security role in Africa. And the term referring to this neo-colonial relationship is la France-Afrique. And this term was obviously coined by none other than Oufwe Boigny mentioning the special relationship between France's former colonies in Francophone Africa and France. And this picture here, and I'm going to conclude definitely with that, is the French Licorne Force in 2011 stepping in with the United Nations to resolve the so-called post-electoral crisis which pitted Laurent Gagbo against Alassane Ouattara in Côte d'Ivoire. So you can see, even up to this very day, even before, obviously, the Malian intervention by the French, the French remain responsible to a large degree, or the ultimate arbiter for domestic security in many Francophone African countries. Thank you.
Thank you, Marco. For the next uh, 20 minutes, we will move from uh, Cote de Avo to the Spanish Guinea, and the uh, next lecture will be in the French language, and uh, it will be given by Colonel Manuel Garcia Cabades. Manuel Garcia is a Spanish officer, a colonel. He is responsible or is the, the director of the Central Military Library. Manuel served in the, in the uh, Spanish Army as an infantry a, a, uh, officer and then in a mechanized uh, unit. And he was even uh, located in the Euro forces in, in uh, France and uh, later on in the uh, army headquarters. And uh, hope, uh, I, I must uh, be honest that I, till last year, I never heard about Spanish Guinea. Guinea. And uh, uh, with the help of the uh, conference in Douala, while flying back with the Ethiopian Airlines, I was sure that we will go to the east and then other, uh, <laughs> the airplane was flying to the west. Another 10 minutes and we landed in an island which as far as I know, is the uh, is the is the capital of uh, French uh, uh, Guinea. So, the flow is yours, Manuel, and uh, hopefully we will know we will we will uh, learn something new. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Okay, je vais passer à la langue française qui existe aujourd'hui partout. Bonjour, messieurs, mesdames. Je suis, je m'appelle Général Manuel García Cabezas. Je suis colonel à l'armée espagnole et maintenant je suis le directeur de la bibliothèque militaire centrale. La bibliothèque, ma bibliothèque appartient à une organisation majeure qui s'appelle Instituto d'Histoire et Culture Militaire qui est chargée de préserver et diffuser le patrimoine culturel historique de l'armée de terre. Ma bibliothèque dispose de plus de 200 000 documents, le plus ancien datant de 1478. Elle siège à Madrid et je vous invite cordialement à nous rendre une visite la prochaine fois que vous siégez à Madrid. Dans la diapo, vous avez mon courrier si vous voulez une visite privilégiée. Alors, le travail que je vais aborder sur la Guinée équatoriale. Et la thèse que je vais vous présenter, c'est que le processus de colonisation et de décolonisation de ces territoires africains représente un cas unique dans le contexte des histoires coloniales espagnoles et européennes. Tout d'abord, je dois faire une précision. La Guinée équatoriale a reçu divers noms à travers l'histoire. Dans cet exposé, j'utiliserai Fernando Po pour nommer l'actuelle île de Bioko, où se trouve la capitale de la République Malabo, que je nommerai comme Santa Isabel. La partie continentale sera citée comme Rio Muni. Alors, le territoire dont je vais vous parler comprenait à l'époque deux parties principales. L'île de Fernando Po, avec capitale Santa Isabel, est une partie majeure que j'appellerai Rio Muni, dont la capitale était Bata. La Guinée équatoriale est le seul pays hispanophone de l'Afrique noire. Ce qui ajoute à son isolement et explique pourquoi elle a été pratiquement négligée par les ouvrages portant sur l'Afrique. La Guinée occupe le 0,09% de la surface de l'Afrique soit un peu plus de 28 000 km carrés, approximativement la, sup la superficie de la Belgique. Elle se compose de deux provinces nettement séparées, la continentale, 26 000 km carrés, et l'insulaire, dont Fernando Po, 2 000 km carrés, et à nouveau 17, 17 km carrés, ainsi que d'autres petits îlots. Il s'agit là de, de rester d'un territoire de quelques 800 000 km hérité par l'Espagne 
lors du traité de San Ildefonso avec le Portugal. Les voisins de la Guinée sont Nigeria, 30 fois plus grand, le Cameroun, 17 fois plus grand, le Gabon, 10 fois, et la République de saint Tomé et Principe, 29 fois plus petite. Les diverses populations de la Guinée appartiennent toutes aux Bantous du Nord-Ouest. Il s'agit des Boubis en Fernando Po, venus du continent et des fans dans la zone continentale de l'intérieur, groupe ethnique le plus nombreux qui s'étend largement aussi sur le Cameroun méridional et le nord du Gabon, parvenus dans la région depuis le XIIe siècle, mais repliés vers l'intérieur sous la menace esclavagiste. Il faut mentionner aussi la communauté de Fernandino, une communauté créole de tradition anglaise, issue des esclaves libérés venus du Liberia et de Sierra Leone. L'Espagne est dans la région depuis 1778, quand le roi espagnol Carlos III, la reine Marie du Portugal, accorde par le traité de San Ildefonso de fixer les limites de leur possession autour du sud du Brésil et de changer l'île de Santa Catalina dans les côtes du Brésil et dans les mains des Espagnols par une zone portugaise dans le littoral du golfe de Guinée avec centre l'île de Fernando Po. La première expédition espagnole en 1778, dirigée par les autorités de Virreinato de Buenos Aires, n'arriva pas à installer aucun établissement et retourna trois ans plus tard sans consolider une colonie. Le territoire resta pourtant sans présence espagnole et donna la possibilité à d'autres puissants européens présentes dans la zone à s'y installer, notamment les Anglais. La lutte contre l'esclavagisme donna une raison aux autorités de Londres pour justifier sa présence à Clarence, la capitale de Fernando Po, comme le sanglé nommé à la future Santa Isabel, actuelle Malabo. En 1819, le Royaume-Uni et l'Espagne avaient conclu un accord pour la suppression de la traite des nègres et l'Espagne souhaitait qu'un des tribunaux créés à cette fin au Sierra Leone soit transféré ailleurs et le gouvernement britannique, sans la sentiment espagnol, choisit Fernando Po. Le gouvernement de Londres s'agit même d'acheter Fernando Po en 1839, mais quand l'accord paraît conclu avec le gouvernement de Madrid, le Parlement espagnol refuse à son accord et le projet est déchu. Mais les, arrêts, les Anglais resteront le seul chef des affaires guinéens pendant près de 50 ans. Jusqu'en 1856, Fernando Po figure dans le Royal Britannic Annual comme territoire anglais, de telle façon que l'influence anglaise dans la population, le mœurs et les traditions de la Guinée resteront pour jamais. À partir de 1858, l'initiative privée et l'action gouvernementale espagnole reprennent le travail d'exploration et colonisation de Sul et du continent, même sans continuité. Mais dans l'esprit du gouvernement espagnol, la Guinée pendant tout le 19e siècle, était surtout Fernando Po. L'intérêt pour la partie continentale ne se marqua qu'à la fin du siècle, et pendant longtemps, Fernando Po ne servit qu'à accueillir des déportés cubains et paninsulés après avoir été une des bases de la lutte contre la traite des Noirs. Ce n'est que vers 1880, qui commençait à se développer les grandes plantations de cacoyers et de caféiers. Mais les désintérêts espagnols pour les possessions continentales extimulaient les profits des factories allemandes, anglaises et françaises, ainsi que des missions protestantes américaines. La conférence de Berlin en 1885 donna les coups de sifflet pour la répartition de l'Afrique parmi les puissances européennes. Les Allemands étaient déjà présents au Cameroun et depuis la seconde moitié du XIXe siècle, diverses maisons commerciales avaient une partie de leurs affaires 
au Rio Muni et Fernando Po. En 1883, la nationale Zeitung annonça que la société coloniale allemande envisageait d'acquérir Fernando Po pour ses activités. En 1884, l'Allemagne avait été autorisée par l'Espagne à effectuer un dépôt de charbon à Fernando Po pour ses navires civils. Et même en 1885, un navire allemand tenta de s'approprier de l'île de Hanovo. Les Français étaient aussi déjà au Gabon et au Congo, et les autorités revendiquaient avec de plus en plus d'insistants les Rio Muni et les îles espagnoles. En 1843, l'Espagne prêta la région de Libreville à la France, et de là se propagea l'influence française, surtout missionnée, négligeant les droits des Espagnols. Tous les deux pays, l'Allemagne et la France, Pourtant, s'empare de territoire que les traités de San Idelfon sont reconnaissait sous la souveraineté de l'Espagne. Et même quand la conférence de Berlin reconnaissait aussi que l'Espagne avait des droits sur près de 300 000 km dans la région, les désaccords sont fréquents parmi les Espagnols, les Français et les Allemands. En 1892, la France et l'Espagne demandèrent l'arbitrage du roi de Danemark, qui ne pu avoir lieu, vu les circonstances et les frittements de la puissance espagnole après 1898, permit à la France de profiter de la situation et d'annexer une large partie de ses territoires. Né le à l'Espagne, à la suite du traité des limites de Paris en 1900, qui est un territoire continental de 26 000 km. L'article 7 de ce traité de Paris accordait même à la France un droit de préférence en cas de cession de tout ou une partie des possessions espagnoles. C'est ainsi qu'en 1904, le gouvernement espagnol et l'Église catholique prit sérieusement en main la colonie y créant de véritables administrations et un évêché alliés tous les deux dans son paternalisme face aux indigènes. La colonisation continentale s'intensifia contre la résistance de quelques tribus fans. Les limites avec les possessions françaises se dessinent sur le terrain et l'occupation du territoire continental deviendra définitive. Le déclenchement de la Première Guerre mondiale aura des conséquences en Afrique et en Guinée équatoriale. Les forces allemandes au Cameroun sont battus par les troupes françaises et anglaises coalisées. Le 1er janvier 1916, Jandel, la capitale du Cameroun, tombe et près de 60 000 personnes militaires et civiles, allemandes et natifs, croisent la frontière de la Guinée espagnole et sont accueillis comme réfugiés dans divers camps, d'abord dans le continent et après, à cause des pressions des puissances alliées, à l'île de Fernando Po. Parmi les réfugiés se trouvaient même le gouverneur allemand au Cameroun, Mr. Evermayer, et le chef des troupes coloniales, le colonel Zimmermann. L'appui à cette foule de gens exigea au gouvernement espagnol un grand effort logistique, y inclut l'envoi pour la première fois des troupes espagnoles pour renforcer la surveillance et le soutien des camps de réfugiés. Les derniers contingents de réfugiés allemands quitteront l'île de Fernando Po en 1920. Nous voilà maintenant en 1940. La Deuxième Guerre mondiale ravage l'Europe. L'Espagne reste neutrale, mais la Royal Navy a imposé un blocus naval dans tout le monde et des vaisseaux allemands et italiens cherchent refuge dans le port de Fernando Po. En même temps, les colonies françaises autour de la Guinée se débattent entre la soutien à De Gaulle, le Cameroun, et la fidélité au gouvernement du Pétain. En 1942, un Reich de forces britanniques et d'Issoy, Special Operation Executive, enlève trois navires réfugiés à Santa Isabel et les dirige au port de Victoria, dans la côte de Nigeria. Le gouvernement espagnol décida alors à nouveau de renforcer la garnison militaire à Fernando Po. 
malgré les soupçons alliés de que ces renforts seront prêts à bouger les efforts allemands dans la région. La fin de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale et la naissance de l'ONU déclenchent un mouvement pour la décolonisation du vieux empire européen, spécialement en Afrique. En Guinée, il ne se passe pas un mouvement généralisé contre la présence espagnole dans le territoire, mais à partir des années 50, divers partis politiques indigènes, plus ou moins radicaux, favorisent les mouvements émancipatoires. Quelques-uns cherchent une indépendance totale auprès de l'Espagne. D'autres postulent le maintien des liens avec les métropoles. Il y a aussi des divisions différentes à osciller dans le continent. Le défi est de chercher un ou des pays indépendants. Même quand il n'y avait pas de consensus interne dans, parmi les Guinéens, les soutiens extérieurs et les souffles qui viennent de l'ONU soulèvent l'esprit émancipatoire. Le gouvernement de Madrid tente de modifier quelque chose pour que rien ne change. En 1959, la Guinée n'est plus une colonie et devient province espagnole comme Sevilla ou Barcelone. Les Guinéens élurent leur maire de leur ville et envoient leurs représentants à la Cortes Parlement espagnol. Il reste une différence avec les autres Espagnols. Ils ne sont pas obligés à faire le service militaire. En 1963, le gouvernement espagnol fait un pas inédit dans le contexte du régime politique du général Franco. Il accorde un statut d'autonomie à la province équatoriale. C'est-à-dire, les Guinéens peuvent former un gouvernement et un parlement au-delà de la représentation nationale à Madrid. Mais les événements surpassent le changement politique. Les élections au Parlement autonome, la pression internationale, les divisions parmi les ministres de Madrid sur l'avenir de la Guinée débouchent à la reconnaissance de l'indépendance de la nouvelle République de Guinée équatoriale le 12 octobre 1968, 190 ans moins 10 jours après l'arrivée du premier espagnol à la région. Le 12 novembre 1968, la Guinée devint le 126e membre des Nations Unies. Jusqu'ici l'histoire. Maintenant, quelques commentaires. Si je me suis bien expliqué, vous auriez compris que l'arrivée des Espagnols en Afrique a eu lieu vient auparavant que seuls des autres puissants armés européens, excepté le Portugal. Et que ce sont les Espagnols qui ont quitté plus tard les colonies en Afrique. Le Maroc espagnol atteint son indépendance en 1956, la Guinée en 1968 et l'armée espagnole quitta le Sahara en 1975. On peut dire que l'Afrique a été toujours présente dans l'histoire espagnole depuis le début de l'histoire. Hannibal passa par l'Espagne, mais aussi les Berberes nord-africains, et toujours l'histoire de deux côtés de la Méditerranée, ont été et continuent à être liées par deux liens à la sable. Mais l'étude de la Guinée, de l'histoire de la Guinée, a été négligée par les historiens de toute espèce, y inclus les Espagnols. Je peux citer à mode d'exemple l'ouvrage sur l'histoire de l'Afrique patronisé par l'UNESCO dans les années 90, dans la version espagnole de sept volumes, avec plus de 1000 pages par volume. Il y a eu peu de pages, je dirais peu de lignes, versant sur la Guinée équatoriale. C'est vrai que la colonisation espagnole de la Guinée a été faible, discontinue et je dirais pas violente. On ne peut pas nier qu'une structure coloniale s'est imposée sur le territoire et la population guinéenne, mais affaiblie par des institutions de patronage sur les natifs suivant la meilleure tradition du père Lacassas qui, dès le début de la colonisation de l'Amérique, postulait par une sorte de reconnaissance de la personnalité humaine des Indiens américains. Jamais la présence espagnole en Guinée a été massive et la colonisation économique n'a consisté qu'en des travaux personnels 
pas comme on a vu dans d'autres régions du continent africain. Il y a d'autres particularités dans le processus historique qui nous occupe, par exemple dans l'aspect militaire. À cet égard, on peut souligner qu'au contraire que dans d'autres équations coloniales espagnoles et européennes, la présence militaire dans la région analysée a été minimale comparée avec d'autres expériences. Par exemple, le gouvernement espagnol déploya près de 200 000 troupes à l'occasion des troubles avec le Cuban dans les derniers décades du 19e siècle. Les troupes espagnoles envoyées dans un certain moment pendant la lutte contre les indépendantistes cubains représentent l'expédition majeure de l'histoire qui a été expédiée à travers l'Atlantique dans la direction Europe-Amérique. Un autre point à signaler, c'est que l'armée espagnole n'a pas conformé d'une militaire combattante avec des natifs guinéens. Au contraire, quand dans bien d'autres cas européens en Afrique, et même dans les cas des forces indigènes formées par l'armée espagnole au Maroc et même à Cuba. La défense de la souveraineté espagnole et le maintien de l'ordre interne en Guinée se sont basés à la présence de détachement naval à Fernando Po et la formation d'unités paramilitaires avec des fonctions policières et d'administration territoriale. Seulement à l'occasion de la première et deuxième guerre mondiale, on a expédié des faux contingents militaires de l'armée régulière espagnole. Même pas encore pendant le processus de décolonisation des derniers moments, la présence militaire espagnole dans le territoire a été massive. Et finalement, je crois qu'il fallait souligner notre circonstance particulière dans les sujets étudiés dans ce travail. L'indépendance de la Guinée n'a pas été précédée par un soulèvement massif de la population contre la présence espagnole. Ni il y a lieu un mouvement sous la forme d'un sujet militaire, il n'a pas existé aucun front de libération en quelle que soit la forme. En fait, en retournant la réalité, on pourra dire que la naissance de la nouvelle république a été un cas d'émancipation consenti, puisqu'à l'époque, la région jouait d'un système politique amélioré. Mais le résultat est un pays singulier, un pays indépendant de 28 000 km carrés, parmi lesquels 26 se trouvent dans le continent, mais la capitale du pays, du pays se trouve dans une île de plus, à plus de 200 km de la partie la plus grande du territoire. La nouvelle république a suivi après 1968 une histoire accablée. Mais je vais dire finalement une chose. La Guinée n'a pas eu ni guerre civile, ni guerre avec ses voisins par des raisons de limite. Et je crois que ça représente une exception. La Guinée est vraiment un pays singulier. En 2018, nous célébrons le 50e anniversaire de son indépendance. Merci bien. Thank you, Manuel. Yeah, it's the first time that at least I, I heard about a, a, the Spanish a, a special a, a colonial a, a policy in Africa, and uh, I, later I will ask you how come that Spain, which was one of the main colonists uh, 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 in the earlier days, didn't really find or didn't really uh, uh, have uh, colonists in, Sp in Africa. So, but maybe later okay. when we will have some still time for some questions. As the next speaker will take us a little bit southern, still in Africa, uh, to the war bush in Rhodesia. So the speaker will be uh, Gil Bandola. And the Gil, I will have to change my glasses. Gil Bandola is the director of the Middle Eastern Studies at the center of the national interest in Washington, D.C. From 2009 to 2016, Dr. Bandola served as an infantry officer in the United States Marine Corps. He deployed twice in Afghanistan as a light armored reconnaissance platoon commander 
and the commander advisor with the Georgian army. Dr. Bandola holds an AB in history from the Bowdoin, Bowdoin College and uh, a, 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 doc, a PhD degree in history from the University of Cambridge. Dr. Bandola, the floor is yours. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to the Israeli Commission for hosting such a great conference. I want to answer one simple, or try to answer one simple question today. Why did a few hundred Americans travel halfway around the world to fight in someone else's civil war in southern Africa in the 1970s? A recent book, like most of the history before it, describes these men as mercenaries, ideologues, and racists, quote, revolutionaries for the right, end quote. I believe that is largely inaccurate. So the Chimarenga, this is a Shona word that means more or less a war of liberation or national liberation. I'll try to give a, as brief as possible a, a kind of orientation here. This ran from 1965 to 1980, but really the war didn't really get hot until the kind of mid-70s, 74, 75. Uh, Rhodesia, in order to preserve a white minority government, declared a unilateral declaration of independence in, in November 1965, Ian Smith's government. As a result, Rhodesia was sanctioned and isolated, although it did receive aid from South Africa and was able to evade some of, the, some of the sanctions put against it by most of the world. The forces opposing it, two separate, and it's important to understand this is more or less a three-sided war. Um, the two primary parties, ZANU, which, which Robert Mugabe eventually took control of, the, the Zimbabwe African National Union, um, was Chinese supported. Its army was ZANLA, the, the Zimbabwe African National Liberation Army. Its rival, and, and uh, sometimes co-belligerent, was ZAPU, the Zimbabwe African People's Union. Its armed force was ZIPRA, the Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army. They were, and they were supported by the Russians. Uh, it's important to note, too, there's an ethnic dimension. Uh, ZANU and ZANLA were, were mostly Shona, which was about 80% of the black population in Rhodesia, whereas uh, ZIPRA, ZIPRA and ZAPU were Nidabele, which were the other 20%. Uh, both forces had sanctuaries in, Z in Zambia and Mozambique, respectively. There was limited urban terrorism throughout the war, but it was primarily a Marxist rural insurgency. I put Marxist in quotes there because the vast majority of these, uh, you know, and I, if we had time, I could give some, some anecdotes from interviews, but the vast majority of the guerrillas had no conception or understanding of, Mar of Marxism, that, you know, they carried literature on their person into battle, but were not communists in any real sense. Oh my God, not another one. These words were, were uttered to the man on the, on the far left of that shot an American named Eugene, Eugene Pomeroy, a uh, former army officer and then an enlisted Rhodesian SAS soldier when he showed up as, as a Yank uh, in Rhodesia in, in 1976. There, it was estimated that 150 to 350 Americans were serving at the height of the war in Rhodesia. They received a mixed reception. You say roughly, you know, anecdotally, roughly 50% of the, of the Rhodesian soldiers welcomed them in some form or fashion. 50%, you know, ranged from light ribbing to you know, a sense of, of arrogance and we don't need you. Uh, civilians were generally friendlier than soldiers. As I noted at the bottom of the slide there, uh, more than one American took home a, a Rhodesian wife at the end of the war. Uh, that was not that uncommon. The U.S. contingent, and, and I only have time to really talk about the Americans, but the other contingents of foreigners that served, there were a lot of Brits, a lot of Anglophone troops in general, a hodgepodge of other nationalities. The Americans were peculiar in that they were a big group, uh, but unlike, unlike the Brits, the Australians, some of the other, other Anglophone countries, they didn't police themselves very well because the U.S. Army, which a lot of these men came from, had been such a big beast in Vietnam, a big conscript army. So most of them didn't know each other. They hadn't served in the same regiments. So there were, there were a lot. The Americans grew to have a reputation as kind of a lot of them were, were braggarts. A lot of them showed up and, and said they had war records that didn't really stand up to a lot of scrutiny. A lot, the Rhodesians often, especially later in the war, dismissed the Americans as... as war heroes in quotes. Uh, one contemporary source claimed that Americans in Rhodesia had an 80% desertion rate throughout the war. Uh, that may be a little bit high, and certainly by the, the last 18 months of the war, both Rhodesians and, and foreign volunteers were leaving at an accelerating rate, um, but, but it was certainly a lot higher than a lot of other contingents. So I want to quickly discuss a couple of the primary units. The Saints, who the, the title of this uh, paper refers to, were the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Established in 1961, they can be thought of as, as essentially an all-white Praetorian Guard for the, for the, for the regime. Uh, they really function as the hammer, the heavy combat troops for Rhodesia, along with the Rhodesian African Rifles, who I'll talk about briefly next. 
1974, they began using a system called Fire Force, and that's a, you know, whole books have been written on that. It's fascinating. It's a, f a form of kind of air ground tactics to, to fight a very violent and, and quick kind of reactive counterinsurgency in rural terrain. The entire battalion was parachute trained from 1977 on. Uh, the Saints, the RLI really was an African foreign legion. They, they considered themselves such. They ran roughly, give or take, 40% of the force was foreign, perhaps even more. Um, these men came from at least 31 nations. There was one Cherokee Indian, there was a Brazilian, there were Swedes, there were two Isl Icelanders who showed up towards the end of the war. It was a complete hodgepodge. 31 may be an understatement. That's the best guess from, from men that served there. The, the regiment also had its own distinctive language, tal, an African word meaning talk, but most of the men there just called it the Rhodesian, called it the slang, um, the, the regimental slang. When a, it was a mix of, of Afrikaans words, English, loan words from Shona. Uh, when John Cronin, one of the, one of the, who wrote one of the better memoirs of the war, an American uh, Marine veteran who showed up there, when he arrived at the regiment, he was told, good luck over there. No one, no one else in the Army understands a damn word they say. The Rhodesian African Rifles were an entirely black unit, but white officer. They had black officers towards the end of the war, really the last 18 months to two years. The man standing there is an American. That's John Smith, who had an interesting career, was a civil rights reporter in the U.S., then served as a Green Beret, but was stuck as a, as a public affairs officer behind the, you know, behind the front in Vietnam, uh, and wanting to see combat and test himself, came to Rhodesia and became a platoon commander at the ripe old age of 33 with the Rhodesian African Rifles. The RAR, like the RLI, was considered an elite, uh, you know, an elite combat unit. They also participated in fire force in the last four years of the war, uh, and like the RLI, were a real hammer and, and were, saw it intense amount of combat on a daily basis. I should add, in, in covering that too, that the Rhodesian security forces throughout the war were usually about 70 and later in the war 80 percent black. The SAS and the Salute Scouts, the two most elite units who were very storied and much has been written about them, um, kind of polar opposites as far as Americans were concerned. The SAS, uh, was both these units con conducted a lot of reconnaissance, a lot of external operations in, in Mozambique and Zambia and even assassinations or assassination attempts of, of high-ranking high insurgent leaders. But they were very much the scalpel as, a, as opposed to the hammer of the R RLI and the RAR. Uh, the SAS was, was up to 30% foreign, a fair amount of Americans and other foreigners, especially Brits in the ranks. Uh, the Salut Scouts, on the other hand, was very much a Rhodesian old boys network. You had longtime Rhodesian hunters, uh, former men, like outstanding RLI guys that had been plucked uh, into that unit and then a lot of what they called turn tears. So insurgents who'd been captured, convinced to come around and, and fight for the Rhodesian government. So give or take 60% of the Salute Scouts were, were con essentially converted to insurgents. Uh, there were only five Americans in the Salute Scouts in the entire history of the unit, and one or two of those guys had very checkered records. Now, Soldier of Fortune, this was a magazine that came out during the war. It's still published online, I believe. You, don't, you can't find it in paper anymore. It was uh, a combination of stuff appealing to actual, you know, actual servicemen, a, a growing cadre of mercenaries, especially in Africa in the 70s, and a fair amount of uh, kind of fluffier stuff to appeal to what, what uh, you know, what we call Walter Middies today. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Brown was an Army Reserve officer and Vietnam veteran who founded the magazine. He was a huge backer of Rhodesia. When you go back through the archives of Soldier of Fortune, I counted 33 articles from when the magazine was founded in 1975, 1980, and that's... I could have been a lot more generous. If you can count anything even tangential, they have four or five Rhodesia articles in, in every issue. Um, so Brown, Brown, I think, claimed a lot of credit for sending volunteers, especially American volunteers, to Rhodesia. However, there, there, many of the veterans told me that that's largely self-serving. Uh, many foreign volunteers, especially those outside the United States and even Americans, had never read the magazine. But it was certainly a huge PR organ for the Rhodesian government throughout the war. More effective, I think, was, was the Samizdat, really, the Rhodesian recruiting packets that circulated among, I, I would suspect, almost every major, major Western army in the world, but certainly Anglophone armies in Germany in particular. Uh, the Royal Marines had a, had a standing order in the mid-70s that junior officers were supposed to confiscate any Rhodesian recruiting material. Uh, I suspect, though, that there was, there was a fair amount of sympathy even in the upper ranks, and, and that didn't really happen. Certainly these, these pamphlets and phone numbers and, and addresses got passed around. And guys sent away, you know, within a few weeks, got back a packet of recruiting materials. Were they then able to send back their packet and get vetted by the Rhodesian authorities? And the Rhodesians were, especially for the bulk of the war, pretty selective in, in, in who they took, even though they were desperate for men. I'll say a brief word about the media. Uh, the American media generally 
with occasional exceptions, adopted a very um, kind of cut and dried narrative of the Rhodesian War that it was a war of national liberation and decolonization. The European media, probably because of the European, the recent European experience with, with decolonization, uh, tended to be, you want to call it even handed or less biased or, or, or certainly more sympathetic to the Rhodesians in general. Um, you can see that that copy of Paris Match was actually cited by a French volunteer who went, who went to the RLI after serving the French Air Force. The elephant in the room, obviously, is race. And, and you know, let's make no bones about it. Uh, you know, Rhodesia was declared independence, became an independent state to preserve white supremacy and to preserve a white minority government that made up about 7% of the population. There was a heavy, entrenched, uh, albeit, you know, to some extent paternal racist system within the country. Now, all that being said, the, I do not think race was, racism was really that heavy a, a motivating factor for the majority of foreign volunteers and Americans among them. Uh, there certainly were races in the ranks. Many men have pointed to some British National Front members they knew were, were kind of floating around the RLI. Um, but the Rhodesians, especially as the war went on and they, and they really accepted the, the inevitability of, of black majority rule and it really became about negoti negotiating the terms of that, uh, you know, negotiating in combat in some ways, they, the Rhodesians did watch out for what they called racialists, and some of those guys were kind of frog marched to the airport if they became too overt in, in, their, in their views. Um, atrocities by both sides did lead to a cycle of revenge throughout, throughout the war. I had one veteran tell me, one, one American veteran tell me that after the two, there were two Rhodesia Air airliners shot down by Zipra, and he said after that we didn't take a lot of prisoners. That was in the last year, year and a half of the war. Um, but again, ultimately, I don't think racism was, was really that a driving force for more than, more than a small number of, of American, American and foreign and general volunteers. Um, by, the time, by the time the war was re really heating up and from 77 on, the writing was on the wall and black majority government was, was going to happen. It was just a matter of how and when. Um, so people showing up at that stage of the war, which included most, most of the American foreign volunteers, knew that was the terms under which they were serving. The other big piece of the puzzle is when you look at South Africa and the role that plays, Rhodesia and South Africa often get conflated, and that's, that's part of the narrative. Uh, when these guys went, some of them went on leave to South Africa, and I had more than, more than a couple tell me they were shocked at how different the climate was, and some of them felt you know, overt hatred towards them uh, from black South Africans they never would have experienced in Rhodesia. The, the racism in South Africa is much more de jure. I mean, you would, you know, segregated everything and the, the apartheid system everyone kind of knows about. Uh, and the other big piece of it is that when the Rhodesians, both Rhodesians and foreigners, went and joined the SADF after the war, 80% of them left in one year. They, they very quickly decided South Africa was not a system or an army they wanted to be a part of. Uh, so where does that leave us? Ultimately, if we, if we discount, if we, you know, if we say that racism is probably not the primary motivating factor for most, anti-communism is cited a lot and just ideology and anti-communism. I would tell you this is, this is anecdotal, it's hard to put a number on this, there's no real data point, but I don't, I don't really think there were that many true believers. I think there were, there were a few hardcore anti-communists and, and soldier fortune certainly peddled that line and this was the next front in the war against communism. Uh, and there were some folks like that, but by and large I don't think there were that many true ideologues that came out there to fight to confront communism in, uh, in Rhodesia. Uh, the mercenary line was used a lot. But that doesn't hold up to even really cursory scrutiny. I mean, the foreigners, none of these, the Rhodesians were very explicit about this. The foreigners enlisted at Rhodesian pay scales. Usually, a few Brits kind of talked their way in, but usually they dropped at least a pay scale. And numerous officers came in as enlisted men because they, they wanted the chance to fight. Uh, Rhodesian pay was good, but not great. Usually better than, than comparative American pay scales, but not by leaps and bounds. But uh, the bottom line was, uh, by showing up to Rhodesia and taking Rhodesian dollars, that money couldn't really leave the country. One man referred to himself as an economic captive. So I, very few men left, left any richer than they showed up. Um, the Rhodesians did, I think, hope to have, have some of these uh, foreign volunteers come in as settlers and stay. I think that was probably unrealistic on their part. Again, some of them took wives, but all, almost all of them left with those wives and may have done so even had the war turned out differently. That, that settler aspiration, I think, was, I think was a pretty, even for the Rhodesians, I think was a pretty minimal aspiration. And certainly, I don't think very many Americans and even some, some Brits would stay, but I think very few Americans would have even had the war been won. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to this. As one man said, he said, there was a good punch up to be had. The vast majority of Americans, I think the vast majority of foreigners in general, really showed up to have a fight. I mean, that, that's as, as amoral and as simple as that, that is, that is the ultimate, I think, the driving explanation for why you had people going halfway around the world uh, to fight in somebody else's war. 
And in the American context, you had kind of a unique, if you want to call it a perfect storm, a unique set of circumstances. You really had two types that were both sort of equally disaffected. You had some, some legitimate Vietnam combat vets, some of whom had seen heavy combat in, in you know, in really well-regarded units. John Cronin's a good example, uh, who just weren't ready to live a peacetime life, who tried and went back to the military and very quickly got sick of it and, and punched out at the first opportunity and, and went to Rhodesia, usually in a matter of months. And then there were a lot who had just missed Vietnam, guys, but usually, sometimes officers, but, but enlisted as well, who had uh, who had come in in the kind of early 70s, had grown up watching Vietnam on TV, had been the, the rare kids in high school that wanted to go experience that, and then and got in in 70, Four, 73, 74, 75, and just missed the war. Uh, and there were plenty of those. One of the guys on the RLI slide, Paul, Kel uh, Paul Kelso, was one of those in the RLI. Um, both types, though, confronted the same situation. They confronted a U.S. Army that was in shambles in the wake of Vietnam, that was confronting race riots, drugs, and, and boredom. I think the best, uh, the best line I heard, I'll let a Brit speak for the Americans, describing his service both in Northern Ireland and then in the, in the British Army of the Rhine. He said, when he got done, he said, I was no longer Army Barmy but he still wanted to fight. So it really was, at the end of the day, it, it sounds simplistic and it's, it's a, a story as old as time, but despite the kind of the, the ideological template we try to put on the war now, it really was primarily guys looking to prove themselves in combat, whether because they, are, they already had and they wanted more of it or they hadn't experienced it at all. Uh, time precludes a discussion of contemporary relevance of some of these issues, but I think the heart of what I'm getting at leaves a lot of food for thought in the wake of I mean, we still, still see foreign volunteers around the world fighting other people's wars, probably most recently uh, with both ISIS and its Kurdish enemies uh, in Iraq and Syria. Thank you. Thank you, Gil, for sharing with us your research on, on and about the foreign volunteers. Unfortunately, we had some foreign volunteers during our, on the Arab side, invasion during this uh, our war for independence. Fortunately, we had the help of uh, foreign, most of them Jewish people, uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreigners who came and joined the Israeli Defense Forces, and uh, you will hear about it later on. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Irit Miller Katab. Irit is an Israeli uh, lecturer, and uh, she had her PhD from the Bar Ilan University. She is an expert for the relations between previous Emirate of jo Transjordan and later on Jordan with the Jewish people in Palestine and then with the State of Israel. So uh, Dorit will talk about the meeting between Faisal and Weitman in the early uh, days of the 20th century and then she will go on till the relation in between Transjordan that became Jordan after 1948 and the State of Israel. So, oh wait, the floor is yours. Well, first I would like to thank you, Danny, and uh, where is uh, Benny, but thank him for the lovely organization of the conference. And uh, well, Mountains don't meet, but people do. And this is a phrase that tells a story about the human nature where a smile and an honest word can unify a gap of thousands of miles and years. The year 2018 is a very symbolic year in Israel. This year, um, the State of Israel celebrates 70 years of its establishment after 2,000 years of exile a dream of generations had come true, and the Jewish people finally came to live as an independent nation. To understand how the dream comes reality, I drew a timeline starting 101 years ago. 19, I'm sorry. Nineteen seventeen is the Balfour Declaration in November, which actually declares that during the First World War, British policy became gradually committed to the idea of establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. After discussing in the British cabinet the conclusions with Zionist leaders, 
the decision was made, known as the form of a letter, by Lord Arthur James Balfour to Lord Rothschild. The letter represents the first political recognition of Zionist aims by great power. This is the letter as it was sent. Right after, on June 4th, uh, 1918, actually started the meetings between the two parties towards the end of World War I. Kaim Weizmann, head of the World Zionist Organization, and later the first president of Israel, established cordial relations with Amir Faisal, the son of Sharif Hussein of Mecca, and later the first king of Iraq. Shortly the, uh, further, the two would sign an agreement, establishing an alliance between an unborn Jewish state and an unborn Arab one. The historic meeting took place in Aqaba between Kaim Weizmann and Amir Faisal, one of the head of the Arab re rebellion against Turks and a British ally. The two leaders discussed cooperation between the Jewish and the Arab nations movements. After a few meetings, they signed the faisal weizmann Agreement in the year of 1919. The main points of this agreement include the Arab recognition of the Balfour Declaration and an obligation of the Jews to assist in the development of an Arab state. Uh, Faisal reconciled the agreement after the Arab demanded for independence wasn't accepted and the French and British received mandates over the area. I should, re I should remind you that during World War I there was the agreement of Sykes-Picot at uh, 1916. In December 1918, Faisal and Weizmann met again in London. In the interim, Faisal said uh, had captured Damascus, Damascus, which had hoped would be the capital of the Arab Kingdom promised by the Brits, but his regime the, uh, there was fragile, and in their talk on December 11th, uh, Weizmann pro uh, promised to help from the Zionist movement, and uh, there was another agreement on, uh, signed at uh, January 3rd, 1919, in which Faisal expressed approval of the Balfour Declaration and Jewish settlements in Palestine. Other clauses ensured freedom of religion and Muslim control of the holy places sacred to Islam. Yeah, this is a, you can, you can see some of the words both leaders wrote. Well, Faisal had his own ambitions to certainty was uh, about the, the British support for the Jewish homeland for his own cause. His possession changed over time and certainly the faisal Weizmann agreement had very little chance to succeed to success despite perhaps hope and uh, political leverage of their side. In the end, however, the Balfour Declaration gave momentum to what might have been one of the first peace agreements between the Jews and the Arabs. Here you can see both Weizmann and uh, Faisal looking similar Okay, <laughs> uh, Weizmann is on the left side. In the summer of 1929, the Arab of uh, Palestine initiated reopening and massacre against the Jewish population in several towns in Israel. And they tar the, the targets were not Zionist, who had uh, disposed an Ar uh, Arab uh, 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 and their lands, but for the most part of Jewish communities of the old Yeshuv communities that had lived in Palestine for many hundreds of years. The British were awfully unprepared to deal with their disturbances. 
The British flew, in addition, uh, reinforcement from Egypt and elsewhere. The riot spread to Tel Aviv, to Haifa and Safad as well. And the speech that Weizmann gave on the 20th Zionist Congress in uh, 1937 was uh, given um, was given before the 20th Zionist Congress in uh, Zurich, in Switzerland. On, on August 4th, he addressed the Arab uh, revolt and actually mentioned the Peel report that actually uh, said that th there would be rules for settlements and for aliyah of the Jews from Europe to Israel. Well, this is here the, the British Palestine Mandate St. James Conference in 1939. After having reviewed the results of the Woodhead Commission, the British government decided to investigate alternatives to partition as a solution to the problem in Palestine. To the end, the British called for a conference of Arab and Jews to discuss previous uh, scenarios the St. James Conference, also known as the Round Table Conference, brought together Arab and Jewish delegations, each with their own internal, uh, internal differences. On the Jewish side, groups within the Jewish agency organized under the leadership of Chaim Weizmann, and the Arabs were led by the Mufti Hajamin al Khusni. In addition to the Arabs of Palestine, the Arabs of Egypt, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Transjordan, and Yemen were also representative. From the start, the conference was fought with difficulties. The Arab delegations refused to meet directly and formally with the Jewish representatives since they did not recognize the legi legitimacy of the Jewish agency. As a result, the British were forced to negotiate with each delegation individually. British proposals at the conference were met with resistance on both sides. Since no agreement was reached, the British formed its own policy. As they had suggested at their conference, only 75 Jews would be allowed to immigrate over the period of five years. This quota would be uh, failed to capacity only if economic conditions permitted it. Another provision authorized the regulations of uh, further land purchases in Palestine by Jews. These policies were start, uh, started formally in the White Paper of 1939, resulting uh, in a storm of uh, protests by Zionists uh, throughout the world. Moving to November 29, 1947, the General Assembly Resolution 181, also known as the Partition Resolution, the ad hoc committee approved the proposal of partition with economic union and uh, uh, on 29th November, the Assembly approved the plan with 33 votes in favor. As you can see, the country is divided as for those who were for, against, and abstained. Right after the decision, David Ben-Gurion watched the celebrations that took place all over the country. People were dancing at the streets, drinking, very happy with the decision, but he was wise enough to know that the celebrations are too soon to be, and right after the declaration, right after the decision, during that night, the first stage of the independence war had started. The Israeli-Arab war, the independence war, was actually uh, a war that started at 47 and uh, was ended at 1949. 
after Israeli, Israel declared it, it, its independence, the fighting interfered with other Arab forces, joined the Palestinian Arabs in attacking territory of the former Palestine mandate. On the eve of, of May 14th, the Arab launched an air attack on Tel Aviv, which the Israelis resisted. This action was followed by the invasion of former Palestine mandate by Arab armies from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. Saudi Arabia sent a formation that uh, fought under the Egyptian command. British trained, trained forces from Transjordan eventually intervened in the conflict, but only in the areas that had been designated as part of the Arab state under the United Nations partition plan. And the corpse separatums of Jerusalem. After tense early fightings, Israeli forces were able to gain the overseas. Though the United Nations brokered two ceasefires during the conflict, fightings continued on to 1949. Israel and the Arab states did not reach any formal, formal armistice uh, armistic uh, agreements until February under separate agreements between Israel and the neighbor, neighboring states of Egypt, Lebanon, Transjordan, and Syria. These board lines, nat uh, nations agreed to formal ar armistic lines. Israel gained some territories formally granted to the Palestinian Arabs under the United Nations resolutions in 1947. Okay, this is a, a picture of uh, Israeli fighters in Eilat, on Brashash. Mm -hmm. They painted the flag by themselves. Israel was only born that time. And 100 years after the meeting of two great leaders, Weizmann and Faisal, the establishment of two states, Israeli and Jordanian, uh, one thing is for sure. If you can dream it, you can do it, said by Walt Disney. Thank you. Thank you, Orit, for taking us, taking us back to the Middle East. Uh, we have 10 minutes left for a question, and maybe the first question will be mine to Manuel from uh, Spain. Uh, I really don't understand how come that uh, uh, Spain, which was one of the main colonial power, neglected Africa. And uh, we know the colonies that in Central America, in South America, even in the Pacific, and how come that uh, uh, in Africa, except uh, Guinea, the, the case, and a little bit in, in the area of Morocco, we're not, uh, we, we cannot recognize any other Spanish colony. Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Okay, to understand the situation of Guinea and the imper in, 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 in colonial empire, we have to go back to the Colon times. At the Colon times, the Portuguese, a great country, and Spain, a Greek country at this time, decided to divide the world by the Tratado de Tordesillas. And then we agree, America for the Spanish, Africa for the Portuguese. Okay, and this is Anastasio, Guinea. Okay, in, in, in America, we fought many times, the Portuguese and the, and the Spanish, about the delimitation of the Tratado de Tordesillas. That means this is your limit, this is your limit, especially in colonial Sacramento, very well known for the Portuguese, very well known for the Spanish. That is in the south of, of, of Brazil. Finally, with the treaty of San Ildefonso, we agree. Okay, this party for you, Brazil and so on and so on. And we said that the, Brit the Portuguese and a small island, just the island, is a, a Fernando Po. And they gave up the right to trade in the continental part, but the continental side was not in the hand of the Portuguese, neither on other country. I mean, 
the Portuguese were, were the first to colonize just the coast, it is true, the uh, 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 African line. Okay. In the 19th century, we get into Africa once again, and then we have like a colony in Morocco, in the Sahara, okay, eh, in Guinea. Okay. Morocco, it was not exactly a colony. It was a kind of mandate, sub-mandate, because the fact the authority was on the hand of the French, and they said it one part for the Spanish. In the Treaty of, of Paris in 1900, we agree also with the uh, French a part in the Sahara Desert, what we call Spanish Sahara, okay? But this was also an, a special kind of, of colony. But then the final point is Africa belongs to Portugal, America belonging to uh, uh, America, except up to Spain, Spain, except any colony, Guinea, Equatoria, and the Philippines, that it is also out of our uh, range of, of empire. And, sorry, my surprise in this committee that we, we have not been talked about the Spanish empire and the collapse of the Spanish empire that happened in, in the 90, at the end of the 19th century and finished with the decolonization of Guinea. Then I suppose here should, uh, should have more French and British uh, uh, lecturer to know what happened in Africa because 19, the 20th century was the Africa decolonization era. I don't know if you have answered your question. I have a question for Professor Wies. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation that brings us to the beginning of the France Afrique. Uh, I would like to move a little bit to the present time, in a way, if you allow me and the audience and the chair allow. Uh, I agree, and I think everybody could agree, that uh, France is the security guarantor of many, in many countries. And how, in, in this light, because I agree for that and it's very well explained, how you can read, especially in the, in the recent time, this wave of turmoil that affect many uh, former French colonies, in the, especially in the area of the Gulf of Guinea. I just mentioned Gabon, uh, Togo, Benin, and especially going deep a little bit in an in area in uh, Central African Republic that seems uh, a land, uh, a another failed state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrico, for this uh, question. Obviously, that's very interesting. Um, I mean, the different answers to that question. I mean, on the one hand, obviously, it's how the security institutions were built up. So typically, Cote d'Ivoire illustrated, well, there, were never, there was never a proper investment in security institutions that would be truly independent and lasting. I think that's the one, the security apparatus in many of these states remains at a rather little developed stage. And I think the second one, which major point I'd like to make, and obviously I think we can continue this discussion because it would take forever and ever because each country obviously has its you know, individual history. Um, but another one is what um, Fred Cooper called the gatekeeper state or uh, Jean-Francois Bayard called uh, the theory of extraversion. So meaning that the elites they get all the benefits, whether it's from development money, whether it's security, so they get all that. But those below them, or the, who are not close to them within the regime, they don't get that. So therefore, they are the gatekeepers to what comes in from the outside. But therefore, those who are not the gatekeepers are envious. They want also to get there and to become the gatekeepers themselves. And it's a way, because once then they're in the position uh, according to the theory of extraversion, that they can further mobilize these resources from the outside. 
I think that's the overall thing. That leads to additional instability. But then obviously we have other factors which are uh, of a regional dimension, uh, especially from the 90s when uh, the major powers pulled out of Africa, left Africa to its own devices to a certain extent. And now is again a scramble for Africa. So now again we have, if it's a new scramble with a lot of external countries coming in. So think about Chinese investment, the French remaining interested. Uh, the British PM even recently was on a tour of Africa. So they're coming back again, but this pulling out, pulling in, um, it leads to further instability in addition, obviously, then what you have coming in from the Sahel with uh, Tuareg, with uh, Islam Islamist fundamentalism also in the north of Nigeria. But since we're in light of where you are stationed, obviously, you know this even much better than I do. Does th that sort of answer your question? Yes? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Marco. Uh, I'm afraid that it, it will be the last uh, question, so. Thank you very much. My question is for Professor Oi Miller. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. I would like to ask you about this sudden change of opinion from, the, the, from um, Faisal about the agreement before with Weizmann after being uh, proclaimed king in Syria and claimed Palestine. That means that Faisal blow up the agreement with Weizmann, even the agreement, the previous agreement with Clemenceau, who uh, support him if he don't, uh, he didn't claim uh, about Palestine. But Faisal decided when he was proclaimed king in, Afri in, in Syria, decided. How do you explain this change of opinion in Faisal's mind? Thank you for the question, but I will make it real short. It's not only about a person's opinion making a decision, as you know. It's about governments and um, councillors, and also since he moved from one job to another, <laughs> up to being a king, it wasn't his problem anymore. <laughs> short, in short. It actually moved the, the, the main problem remained at the regime, which was long, no longer carried out by him. Okay, uh, thank all the speakers and thank you all the audience and I conclude the session. <laughs>